Hard to believe it, but this is an American cemetery. These are American service members buried on the African continent. It's a small piece of America overseas. Who are the nearly 3,000 American heroes buried in these hallowed grounds? Why are they here instead of back home? And what does this place mean to their families? Imagine losing a loved one at war and then never being able to visit the place where they're memorialized. That's the case for most families with loved ones buried here at the North Africa American Cemetery. We're taking you to Tunisia in this episode of Window Seat. Just a little more than a mile from the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, just a short drive from the famous 9th century Carthage ruins near the Gulf of Tunis on the northern coast of Africa, you'll find an oasis in the desert heat, a revered resting place for heroic Americans, operated by Americans, paid for by Americans, paying tribute to those American heroes. This is where American forces killed in some of the most brutal fighting of World War II on the African continent died 80 years ago, and they were buried not far from the battlefields where they fell, instead of returning back home from war. North Africa was the beginning of the end uh, for the, uh, the Axis forces in Europe. And it's this man's job to make sure their final resting place is well tended to. My name is Ryan Blum. I am the superintendent of the North Africa American Cemetery in Carthage, Tunisia. I work for the American Battle Minds Commission, which oversees 26 American military cemeteries overseas. And this is the only one on the uh, African continent. You could call this a hidden piece of American history. This particular cemetery opened in 1960, but it's rarely talked about, unknown to most. Sure, maybe you've heard about a couple of these kind of cemeteries near famous European battlegrounds, but there are far more than you could imagine, from here in Africa to all over Europe to even this one in the heart of Manila in the Philippines. We showed you the Manila American Cemetery weeks ago here on Window Seat. To learn more about it, just click that link in the upper right corner of this video. But the cemetery in Tunisia is really unique because it is so remote. A lot of Americans don't know about our cemeteries in general. If they do, they know about usually Normandy American Cemetery. Uh, we always like to remind people that there's 25 other sites, and this is a really, really unique location. It's the only one on the African continent, and so it's really special for them to, uh, to come visit this site in a unique part of the world where uh, there's a lot of American history. On 27 pristinely manicured acres in the Saharan Desert, you'll find matching marble markers lined up in formation, and not far from there, this tree-lined terrace leading to a stone wall with the names of thousands who served in this part of the world, but who were never recovered. So we have 2,841 interments. Uh, most of these men and women uh, were lost uh, fighting in North Africa. However, we do have a lot of service members who were stationed in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. Uh, so we represent a large geographical region. We also have 3,724 names on our wall of the missing. The vast majority of these men and women uh, crashed in the Mediterranean, either due to aircraft crashes or their ships being sunk uh, by the Germans during the war. So exactly when and how did their deaths happen? Pay attention to the map room here as Matt gives us a brief history lesson. On November 8, 1942, Operation Torch, Anglo-American invasion simultaneously at Casablanca, Iran, and Algiers fighting not against the Germans, not against the Italians, but actually the Vichy French. A lot of people don't know that we fought against the Vichy French for about three days during the war. Took some considerable casualties, especially at Oran and Casablanca. After three days of fighting, the French capitulate, join us as the Free French, then the British, the Americans, the Free French, we're all moving east together towards Tunisia. Uh, we're now the Axis is starting to build up a big bridgehead. Hitler has been sending massive amounts of reinforcements into Tunis in order to maintain his foothold on North Africa, and to, uh, which he rightly saw as the gateway into uh, Southern Europe. So all along November, December 1942, we're trying to get to Tunis. We call it the race for Tunis. Uh, Allied planners failed to uh, appreciate the, the North Africa, the, the North in North Africa. We do have seasons here. We have a lot of rain, cold weather, all the dirt roads turn to mud. So just like today, we have a lot of rain. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people underestimated that. So it takes us longer than we anticipated to reach Tunis. And every day we fail to reach Tunis, more and more German forces are being built up there. 
And something important to, uh, to note is that these German forces were uh, elite paratrooper regiments, elite panzer units, really battle-hardened troops that fought on the Eastern Front or the campaign in France or the Low Countries or Belgium against a really, really green American force that had little to no combat experience. They go within about 40 kilometers of Tunis around Christmas Eve 1942. That's when this German does his biggest surprise attack, pushes all the way close back to the Algerian border, and Eisenhower realizes it can be a lot more difficult, much more prolonged campaign than he had anticipated. And this is when we start maneuvering in central Tunisia. Two reasons. One, it's drier, it's warmer, it's easier to maneuver. Second reason, we're trying to prevent Erwin Rommel, the famous desert fox, who's been retreating after the second battle of El Alamein from linking up forces in northern Tunisia with all these new German forces. So, February 1943, we have our first major battle against the German army. By major, I mean actual division-sized units maneuvering on each other. Catches us off guard, does a surprise attack, and that's when we have a retreat for about 80 miles, which is the longest retreat that Americans did during World War II, 20 miles longer than the Battle of Bulge uh, two years later. So, Eisenhower then fires Major General Friedenhall, puts General Patton in charge, and General Patton then starts to instill a lot more discipline, starts doing aggressive counterattacks, El Guitar, eventually in the Sidi Nazir region. Week by week, we accomplish more ground. And then uh, by May 1943, the uh, Axis forces in North Africa finally capitulate. We capture a quarter million prisoners. And this sets the stage to be the launching pad for Operation Husky, which is the invasion of Sicily in July 1943. So why exactly are the heroes buried here instead of back on American soil? Why didn't World War I and World War II heroes always return home? So a lot of people ask that question, why do we have the cemeteries? And, and basically it was a choice of the family member. Uh, after the First World War, Second World War, uh, family members actually had a choice to make. They could either repatriate the remains back to the United States or enter permanently overseas. Uh, about a 60-40% split, 60% did choose repatriation, 40% uh, you know, a pretty sizable minority did choose overseas. Every family had different reasons. In fact, some officers actually told their loved ones if anything happened to them, they wanted to be buried here, right alongside their men. In fact, there's even an Olympic athlete among those interred here. So one of our most famous uh, interments we have here is Foy Draper, uh, who uh, ran track for the University of Southern California, and he qualified for the 1936 uh, Berlin Olympics. And he ran on the four-man 100-meter relay team along with his uh, teammate, most Americans have heard of him, Jesse Owens, and so he took uh, the gold medal in those Olympics. So who exactly visits these cemeteries? How often? And who pays for all this? Staff here at the North Africa American Cemetery admit their attendance numbers aren't huge, a little more than 14,000 people per year. That's about 40 people per day, most of them local Tunisians. It's true that uh, Tunisia is kind of an out-of-the-way destination for a lot of Americans. However, we do get quite a few family members who still visit. Uh, just a couple months ago, we had a uh, direct next of kin, as we call it, visit. We had a, uh, a, um, a daughter. She was born in, uh, in April 1943. Uh, her father, whom she had never met, was killed in May 1943. And she came out here for the first time, uh, spent three hours at the headstone, and uh, one of the most uh, emotional thing she said to me was, uh, this is the first time that I've, I, I get to meet my father, and so that was a touching moment. So uh, we do have a lot of families here. We're in contact with a lot of next of kin families via email. The agency that runs this and the other American cemeteries around the world, the American Battle Monuments Commission, has an annual budget of nearly $100 million, a steep price, but a small one to pay in the eyes of many, when it comes to paying tribute and honoring Americans who fought and died for the cause of freedom. Here in Tunisia, the goal is to make this resting place look as perfect and untouched as it has now for decades. We're technically a closed cemetery, uh, so we don't allow veterans, we don't allow family members to be interred here. You had to die in service at that time. So the only one exception generally that we make is uh, if there would be some uh, remains discovered somewhere. If they were to find the remains, identify those remains, uh, the family member has that same choice to either repatriate or enter overseas. Very much the culture now to repatriate, but uh, it's, it's possible it does happen. One question so many people have is, is it safe to visit this place? Ask the superintendent and his answer is unequivocal. I would say Tunisia is very safe. Um, there hasn't been a major uh, a terrorist attack here in, in quite a few years. 
and uh, I've never felt threatened here. Uh, I feel safe coming to work every day and uh, I encourage Americans to visit. Uh, uh, they visit all the time and uh, they always enjoy it. Not only is it important to visit a hallowed field like this given the opportunity, be it in Europe or Asia or here in Africa, but you could argue it's our responsibility given the sacrifice paid by those who rest here. To visit a country that has one of our cemeteries in it and, and not take the time to just you know, come and by there and, and, and pay your respects and, and come and talk to us, the staff, ask any questions you have and to just enjoy the site is, is a shame. We here at Window Seat have been lucky enough to visit several of them all over the world and strongly encourage you to do the same, to study the stories and histories of those men and women whose names are etched in stone. Memorialized here forever on the northern tip of Africa. It has been our privilege to tell the stories of these heroes all over the globe over the last six years, and there are still so many more stories to tell. We hope you'll join us for them.